Today we're at the Loch Nagar Crater on the Somme battlefields. We're here to explore the area, look at the huge crater that still remains there today. We're going to talk about some of the men who dug the mine shafts to lay the mine that blew that crater and some of the men who then had to attack above ground. Let's go have a look. On the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the British dug 19 mines underneath German frontline positions in order to blow those positions and support the attack. Right now we're just south of the village of La Boiselle and here there was a mine dug underneath the German stronghold position called the Schwabenho. You could roughly translate that I think as Schwabian height or heights but that mine was dug underneath the German frontline position here so that position could be blown and it was blown at 7.28, two minutes before the attack here by the British. Today there remains a huge crater hole here called the Loch Nagar Crater that is named after the Loch Nagar Trench where the mine was dug from in order to lay the charge beneath the German position. So let's go and explore and let's see what we can see. So let's get straight into looking at what we came for and then we will tell some of the story here. So the mine blew here and created a mine crater that was about 70 feet deep, 300 feet wide. And look what remains today. This huge, huge hole. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the camera is not going to be doing this justice, but my goodness. This is a huge hole, a terrifying hole. When you look how big this is, 300 feet roughly from here to the other side and 70 feet deep. Wow. In order to dig the mine shaft here beneath this position, men of the 179th Tunneling Company had a huge amount of work to do. The mine was actually started about 400 feet behind the British line. It was dug from a communication trench called Loch Nagar Street, hence where this crater gets its name from. From that point they had to dig downwards at about a 45 degree angle and then forwards towards the German position. The mine crater left here is about a thousand feet away from where this mine was dug. So that's a huge amount of digging that they had to do in order to get this far. About for every foot that they dug through the chalk beneath the ground here, about 48 bags of chalk dust and muck and stones had to be removed and taken out of the tunnel. Now the problem was that couldn't just be left right near the entrance to the tunnel because a huge build up of earth or sandbags there would have alerted German spotter planes to the fact that something was going on. They would have known there was tunnelling, known they were minding under this position. So instead they had to carry those bags right back away from the line in order to disguise the work that was going on there. Now the problem was when this tunnel was eventually dug and the mine was laid, the tunnel had to be backfilled. That was to stop the mine force going back up the tunnel towards the British line. So all those sandbags had to be brought back to the tunnel, back in and used to backfill the mine. Now just by the edge of the crater here they have these really useful information panels and here you can see some stuff uh, about the tunnelers and you can see how a tunnel like this was built. So you can see they went down into the, the ground at an angle and then steeper and then started digging out uh, across to try and get to the position. Now they actually started to dig a couple of different tunnels across but actually only one was used in the end and you can see what I mean. So the, the tunnel was dug and then the mine was filled in and then it had to be backfilled. The reason they would do that is so when the explosion goes it forces the explosion upwards. So some really interesting information that they have here if you, uh, if you come to the site. 
So the work to dig the tunnel here actually started in November 1915, and it was actually the 185th tunnelling company who started that work. The 179th tunnelling company came in in March 1916 to take over from them and finish the job here, digging the tunnel and lock the mine shaft. Now the problem for the British was that the Germans knew full well there was tunnelling going on. It was a well-known tactic by this stage and in fact they were digging tunnels themselves. In order to try and head off the British tunnels they would dig tunnels of their own. They would create listening posts underground, listening to identify where different British tunnelling or mine positions were. Due to that, as the British approached closer here to the German line, the work had to be done in absolute silence. Instead of shovels and pickaxes, small hand tools were used, sometimes the tip of a bayonet to slowly and quietly pick out rocks, catch them in their hand and take them back to a sandbag to be removed along the tunnel. The men would often work in bare foot to not create any noise at all. Now here by the crater they actually have a memorial here to the tunnellers in honoured memory of the men of the tunnelling companies who fought here during 1915 and 1916. So after hours, days, weeks, months of work, the mine shaft was dug up to this point here underneath the German frontline position. Two explosive charged were laid, totaling about 60,000 pounds of explosives. The mine was deliberately overcharged and that was done to fire earth into the air, creating a crater, um, a lip around that crater that the British could use to shield themselves as they advanced here towards the German line. So at 7.28 a.m., two minutes before the British attack, the mine was blown here and men of the 34th Division attacked across these fields in front of us. Um, and again, on the information plaques they have here, they have something really cool that kind of shows you what went on. So here you can see uh, where the German line came down and the British line, and this is where the mine was exploded. And the men attacked here across this area in between areas known as Mash Valley, Sausage Valley, Valley. you have to have a, a Mash Valley with a Sausage Valley um, near La Bourcelle. Now they've got a little bit of work going on here at the moment. They're kind of redoing a lot of these um, sort of duck boards that surround the crater that you can use to explore. Um, so we're just off track slightly for a second here. But they've got some new ones up here so you can see the good work that they're doing. So when we come to this side of the crater, we're looking out towards the British line. So the tunnel was dug somewhere out in this direction, about a thousand feet away from us, dug underneath the ground here to the crater here. And as we said, at 7.28 in the morning, the charge beneath here was fired and it created this huge, huge mine hole. So where we're looking now is where the German front line ran through. So the German front line literally ran through this side of the crater with the German support lines and reserve lines then behind. The British attacking across here. Now among the men who attacked here were the 16th Royal Scots McRae's Battalion. And they attacked here towards the crater at Loch Nagar. Now, they were quite famous because they were made up of a lot of professional sportsmen. They had a lot of professional footballers in their ranks. Now, we're not here on our own today. In fact, Chris from Blogging Through History is here with us. And he's done a video telling their story in detail. So I'm going to hand over to him um, just to tell you a little bit about some of their story. And then I really recommend you go and watch his video. I'm going to link that in the description below. So in the distance you see the trees there and that's where the Royal Scots were attacking from. On their left was the 10th Lincolns. 10th Lincolns were right headed toward the crater uh, and they were afraid of the debris that was falling and so they hesitated and that meant that the Royal Scots moved forward and were facing enfilading machine gun fire on their left exposed flank. But they veered off to the right then into the valley and ended up in the next division over in their position. 
but they managed to regroup. They got up and over the ridge and they were eventually able to take the town of Contamaison. It was one of the furthest advances of any troops that day. And those Royal Scots, uh, that was McRae's battalion. They were professional football players and their supporters that made up that battalion. Now it's great to have Chris from Vlogging Through History with us telling us that story, but something just to note, uh, many of you guys who are fans of Chris will know he also has another channel called Stories of the Great War. Now I believe the video I'm talking about the guys here is currently on his Vlogging Through History channel, uh, but it soon will be on his Stories of the Great War channel. And whilst I've been out here on this trip with Chris, he's filmed loads of really cool, really exciting content that I know is going to be coming on his Stories of the Great War. So I'm I'm going to link that channel in the description below and please make sure that you go check it out because he's got some really good videos coming on there so on the far side of the crater from where you come in they have this um lovely little area that they created here which looks across the area where the british would have attacked and of course where so many young soldiers would have been killed the Loch Nagar crater garden of remembrance and it's nice actually there's some bench benches, flowers. This has um, been done, I believe, since I was here the last time. It looks really nice. And they're actually then mentioned redoing the duck boards where you can see that over here. And they're really kind of creating this area to be a lot nicer, I've got to say, than the last time I was here. So speaking of the boarding that runs around the crater, so the newest boards don't have them fitted yet. Well, some of them do, uh, and all the older boards certainly do. But on every single board, you will see these little plaques. These have the names of guys who were killed in and around this area of the Somme. It's a nice little touch, little something that they've done here. I like it. Well, we heard from Chris talking about the, the uh, Royal Scots who attacked here. Well, they've got a, an interesting memorial here which talks about some of these guys. In the early hours of the 1st of July, 15th Royal Scots, followed by their comrades of the 16th Royal Scots, attacking across this position. And we've got some of the pictures of the guys who were killed that day, who attacked with them. When you come here, I really recommend make sure you take the time, read these information boards, because they really are interesting. So something else they've got here which I really like. So often a uh, forgotten contribution to the Great War is the women who were here. And this bench and the memorial just behind me is in memory of the nurses and VADs of all nations who served in the Great War. I often think of some of the nurses and women who were here serving and the awful things they saw. We talk about some of the injuries and the things that happened to the guys here. Well, the nurses saw all of it. They had to deal with men day after day with horrendous wounds, many of whom would have died in front of them or would have at least known they were going to die. And over here we have the memorial dedicated to the valiant women of all nations who served in the Great War. I like that, it's a really nice thing that they've done here. So when we talk about the men who fought here, I think it's important to also remember some of the individual men who fought here. And this board is really interesting because it shows a picture of Roy Beeling. And Roy Beeling was here, he fought here on the 2nd of July, 1916. And on that day, he lost his best friend, Private Alfred Moxham. And this board tells us the story, the painful story, um, how Roy and another soldier, William, had the painful duty of burying Alfred at the bottom of the crater here. For all we know, he may still lie there today. It's really interesting and then it also talks about how you know Roy used to come back here and visit here all the time and there is the picture of him here at the crater so really do take the time to read these boards when you come here because some of them are fascinating so I hope you guys found this one interesting taking a look at the Loch Nagar crater telling the story of some of the guys who did the incredible work to create this in the first place and then telling some of the story of the men who attacked here if you did enjoy this video, do me a favour, do all the usual YouTube stuff for me there on the screen. 
make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so by heading to my Patreon page, or if you just want to support me as a one-off thing, that's totally fine as well. You can buy me a coffee in the link below. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. I'm gonna see you on the next video.